Hi there and welcome from Ventura, California to today's webinar, Noises Off, GNSS Interference and Mitigation Techniques, sponsored by Novatel, Inside GNSS, and Inside Unmanned Systems, and hosted by WebAttract, the leader in thought leadership webinars. I'm Lori Dearman, Senior Webinar Producer with WebAttract, and I'll be one of your moderators for today's session. As our panelists discuss the current state of interference and jamming and how we can mitigate their effects. You'll also have an opportunity to have your questions answered at midpoint and at the end of the presentation during the Ask the Expert panel session with all three of our panelists today. Now we've invited you along with over 500 professionals representing 58 countries and 36 states and provinces across a variety of industries. And over the next 90 minutes, regardless of your industry segment or your location, we're confident that you'll find today's webinar of value. Now, before we get started, uh, Glenn Gibbons, editor and publisher at Inside GNSS, would like to take a moment to welcome you and introduce our main moderator for today. Glenn? Thank you, Lori. On behalf of the Inside GNSS team, including Richard Fisher, our Director of Business Development, I extend a hearty welcome to our international audience for today's web seminar. And I especially want to thank Novotel Incorporated, our sponsor for today's event. And now in just a few minutes, our panelists will take up the issue of GNSS interference and jamming from three distinct perspectives. Where does it come from and what does it look like? What are the legal and regulatory measures that control it? And what can users and receiver designers do to eliminate or mitigate its effects? Before we begin, though, I just want to explain inside GNSS's approach to our web seminars. <clears throat> we limit ourselves in the number of webinars that we offer each year in order to allow the time needed for preparations to ensure the high quality of the content and presentations by our panels of experts. I believe that you will find today's event provides an excellent example of that approach. And now it's, our it's time to turn the webinar over to our moderator, Demos Gebre Exiaber. Over the years, Demos has helped de develop and moderate numerous inside GNSS webinars. In his day job, Demos is an associate professor of aerospace engineering and mechanics at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus. Demos, thank you for joining us again for today's event. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. We're glad that you're with us for this webinar, and it's going to be very interesting, uh, yeah, as you will see. But before we get going, let's do a quick poll to set the uh, pulse for this uh, webinar. So, Lori, if you could put up the first poll question. Absolutely, and coming up on your screen, you should see that first poll. And uh, with the ubiquity of GPS and our increased reliance on it, jamming and interference incidents are becoming a rare are becoming rare due to increased awareness, are becoming more frequent and worse, uh, occur at the same frequency. Perhaps we're just more aware of them now, or if they're a non-issue for new receiver designs. So, go ahead and let us know what you're thinking on this topic and. Um, once we're done voting, we will uh, share the results with all of you so that uh, you can see how everyone else is voting as well. So it looks like we've got 8% uh, weighing in with uh, becoming rare, 70% becoming more frequent and worse, 22% saying occur at the same frequency, 1% saying non-issue for new receiver designs. So Demos, any thoughts there? Okay, so as we were expecting, I, was ex I, was, I wasn't expecting to see a lot on the last one, uh, but I guess there is one or two. So uh, let's let's just go ahead to the uh, presentations, and you'll get to see that that actually it is becoming an issue, and it's an issue that we need to be uh, uh, aware of and uh, prepared for. So with that, let me introduce our first uh, panelist. Our first panelist is uh, Guy Bennell. Uh Guy has more than 16 years' experience in protecting GNSS receivers from emerging threats, having started his career as a system engineer involved in the development of GPS adaptive antenna systems at Raytheon Systems Limited in the UK. He also spent some time at uh, Rockwell Collins in UK as a lead system engineer for GNSS-related uh, uh, products. Guy was awarded his Master's of Science in Engineering uh, and Communication Engineering from the University of Birmingham and his Bachelor's of Science in Physics uh, with Atmospheric Physics from the University of Wells at Abbotsworth. Uh, Guy is a chartered physicist, a member of the Institute of Physics, and was elected as a fellow of the Royal Institute of Navigation in 2005, 2015 in recognition for his contributions to the field of GNSS and protecting it against vulnerabilities. Guy? Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Demash, and it's a pleasure to be on this panel tonight. Um, I think we've got some excellent speakers. Um, I'm going to, uh, I've got a nice 
set a slide here for you to talk about interference. What was quite interesting, um, and what interference looks like as well, what was quite interesting was the poll results showing that about 78% of you all thought that interference or GNSS interference was becoming more frequent and worse. I think the to be honest, I think the slides I'm going to show you tonight will probably support that theory. Um, well, we know that GNSS is vulnerable to um, for several specific mechanisms because of its low signal strength. Um, interference is one of them. We also, of course, uh, are aware of spoofing or the faking of signals, multipath, atmospheric scintillation, solar activity, but even GNSS segment errors like the uh, GPS timing error that we experienced in January. Tonight, though, we're going to talk about RF interference, both intentional and unintentional, and its effects on GNSS. So the first question that's worth asking is, you know, how many, how likely are you to in, to actually encounter um, interference, and how many threats are out there? Well, we started um, deploying um, GPS L1 detectors at various sites around the world since May uh, 20, uh, 2016, uh, 2015, sorry, a year ago, um, and what we found. Uh, was actually that the GPS L1 spectrum is not clean. Um, right on the left here is our headquarters in Paynton in the UK. It's a rural location, miles away from anything really, and we put a detector up there first. It was the easiest place um, to put one up. I did not think we'd see very much. Um, in fact, after a month, we'd had over 100 events, a lot of them fairly minor, but some obvious deliberate jammers as well. Um, and as you can also see, we've got detectors at the moment at a European airport, um, at our office in San Jose in the U US, and also with, with our distributor in Japan in Tokyo. And they've all seen uh, interference events. So actually, there's more out there than we thought there was. Um, if we just take a look at Spiral in San Jose, this just kind of shows you how many events there are. Um, what we're very keen on doing is quantifying the number of events that take place and look at them over uh, the, the next few years and we'll be able to get a, a quantifiable picture about how the threat is evolving, either getting worse or, or staying at about the same level. Um, and, and you can see here that over a period of three days, there's quite a lot of significant low-level events um, in the Aspirant San Jose office, uh, again, more than we thought. And I think it, it's worth saying that although that here in the, the events that are listed here, there weren't any deliberate jammers. We have seen uh, some deliberate evidence of a deliberate jammer in the US as well as, uh, as other sites worldwide. Um, what we do as we um, classify these events is we, we, we have the detector system actually automatically classifies the type of interference waveform. Uh, for example, uh, on the right-hand side, if I just point to it here, uh, these are different types of interference. Um, they range from uh, white or wideband noise uh, to, um, uh, let me see, we've got chirp signals, chirp sawtooths, a chirp triangular, frequency hopping, CDMA, and um, and up here as well we have unclassified because sometimes the automatic system can't classify the jam and you have to look at it. If you look at San Jose, you can see we've got an awful lot of white or wide band events going on here, um, and there is a, a chirp event somewhere which uh, indicates the deliberate jammer. And I'll talk a little bit more about what these waveforms look like and, and how, how we analyze them in a minute. Um, also worth noting, I think, that, um, that Sunday seems to be a day on which there's less uh, RF interference events than any other day of the week in this snapshot. Uh, I think it might be some sort of coincidence, but it might not, might not be for deliberate jammers, of course. Um, we filter events by priority, um, so the, the detector system we use um, it tries to assign a priority, and the idea is that a high priority event is very likely to cause some disruption to a GNSS receiver, whereas a very low priority is unlikely to. Now, these are not absolute priorities. It means really that you, you need to assess each one and see whether there's a chance it could cause you disruption. Unless you test against them, you don't know for sure. The way that we allocate the probability is to assess the type of interference waveform and the power level that we saw. and 
So if, for example, we detect a chirp interference event, we know that's a deliberate jammer and that will automatically get a high priority. The other signals will, uh, will get uh, assessed on the combination of those things. And if you're wondering why I'm saying that the very low event might need to be looked at, it's because the detector antenna may not be in the exact system that you uh, in the exact location that your system that you're deploying would be when it's in relation to that jammer. So you might want to look at it, for example, with a higher power level. Um, I'm going to go back to the San Jose events that we detected this year now, and what I want to do is show you a few things. Firstly. On the uh, left-hand side of, of each um, signature um, is, is, if you like, the frequency spectrum of the event, which is quite clear. And on the, the right-hand side, this bit here with the blue background, is a spectrogram. So we're talking about the frequency. Um, you're, you're, talk, you're talking about time and frequency here. Whereas over here, you're talking about uh, you're talking about the actual RS spectrum. And if you like, you can build these up into 3D plots. Now. What's quite interesting here is that there are several different events. These are all different events, in fact, um, but there are several that look markedly different, and there are three that look strikingly similar. And the three that look strikingly similar, similar here are all um, deliberate jammers that have gone past the office in San Jose, and it's the same one, uh, most likely, and you can tell that. So actually what's quite interesting is that you can kind of fingerprint uh, the, the actual interference. Um, there's two interesting ones here and here, which look to me as though there could be some sort of repeater going on. And the one here, I'm not sure about. It looks to me as though it might be a deliberate uh, uh, jamming uh, waveform at some distance away. But I can't be 100% certain about that one. But what's quite interesting here is that there are wave, uh, there's a wide variety of different interference waveforms out there, and you really want to know about them and, and understand what the impact might be on your system. Why it's important? Well, it's important because we use GNSS a lot. You know, um, in fact, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security um, talked about 15 of the 19 designated critical infrastructures using some degree of GPS, very often in terms of timing. And actually, it's, it's the same in the UK. Um, a lot of critical infrastructure in the UK and in Europe all uses uh, GPS timing um, to some extent. And we found, certainly in Europe, that some of our critical infrastructure users aren't even aware that they're necessarily reliant on GPS for precise timing, um, and so haven't actually um, a great understanding or, or awareness, actually, of the, of the vulnerabilities, and they, uh, when we tell them about them, they, they, they do ask for a fair bit more information. So it's a very important issue, and interference can cause unexpected problems with systems. Now, uh, this, of course, is a uh, we, we came from the U.S. Coast Guard, um, and it's a warning that. In the last summer, some multiple outbound vessels from a non-US port suddenly lost GPS signal reception. And it goes into talking about some of the alarms that were experienced on the ship. So we had, for example, the loss of uh, GPS input, obviously, but surface search radar, gyro units, electronic display and information systems. Um, quite interesting, really, how much, uh, how much uh, disruption there were to, was to different systems. Now. What's very interesting, if you're not sure what caused that disruption, was it a loss of the signal or something else, is that in the UK in 2010, we carried out a, a trial in the UK, it was called STAVOG, and it was uh, with the general lighthouse authorities in the UK. Um, what they did was take a, a service vessel and put a jammer on the bridge of the vessel um, and switch the jammer on and see what would happen to ship systems. Um, Actually, they thought that they would take out the GPS system and that they would be able to continue to navigate using conventional backup means, such as the radar um, and, uh, and gyro compass. In fact, as you can see here, when they actually turned the jammer on, the bridge of the ship became a very noisy place with alarm bells, sirens, um, lots of distractions for the crew, and all the systems they thought they could rely on to be the backup 
actually didn't work or stopped working because, for example, the ship's radar turned out afterwards to have a GPS receiver in it that no one had realized. Uh, in other words, it needed to get uh, precise time to work. And so that's one set of unexpected ev events that have come about from interference. And without that test, you, you wouldn't have ever thought that these symptoms would manifest themselves. It's also clear that these symptoms are very similar to the symptoms experienced in the previous slide. So you could probably say that the effects in that non-US port were caused um, probably by a, a quite a, a sizable jammer. Um, might have been accidental though, you never know. Um, another one, a, a great story of unexpected behavior that I like to talk about is one that happened at DEF CON uh, last year in Las Vegas. And in a paper called Knocking My Neighbor's Kid's Cruddy Drone Offline, uh, which actually is a, a lesson for anyone flying a drone not to fly it too close to a hacker's house, um, this particular hacker um, tried to disrupt the GPS signal on, a, on the flying drone. Uh, he didn't manage to do much to the drone at first, but what he did notice was that the video output from the drone uh, jittered and became unstable. Um, I, I wasn't he didn't know why I was able straight away to say to, to, to realize that actually it's because the video from the drone is using is being synchronized using a precise time from GPS and again that's another unexpected behavior um, you can when you start monitoring interference suddenly look at unexpected behaviors we um, at a European airport recently were able to show that uh, the airport was having problems with a breach of its compromise or of an ICAO interference loss profile and um, they weren't sure what the cause was. Uh, we set up a, 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 a GPSL1 interference detector close to the installation and the next time the marks, mask breached uh, we caught, uh, we caught a, a signature of an interference waveform right here and, and it correlated time-wise to the breach of the mask. So the unexpected behavior we, we were suddenly able to show what had caused it. Now, I think it's really uh, quite important that um, to, to evaluate the risk to jamming, you have to do a few things. And Grace later on will be giving us a really good uh, understanding of the sorts of things you can do in receivers. What we're trying to do <clears throat> and what I'm trying to do is, is kind of make things a, a, a little bit simpler to test these scenarios and what we're trying to do is create a scenario to go along with some of the interference waveforms and the reason for that is that just capturing an interference waveform on its own isn't going to tell you an awful lot about how your system or your receiver will, uh, will carry on working. So what we're tending to do now is trying to put these into scenarios, for example, a dynamic scenario with a jammer situated in a moving platform or a moving vehicle. <clears throat> um, and once you do that, you can then look at the effects of the receiver, of the interference waveform in the receiver. In fact, I'm just going to go back quickly one slide. I missed that one. Um, so here you go, for example, power levels along here in a receiver exposed to one of these waveforms in a scenario. And then even things like the number of satellites available or even position. And by monitoring these, you could tell very well what the effect um, of interference is on your receiver. <clears throat> so it's really a case of doing things methodically. Um, there's a, we hear a lot of talk about interference in the industry and the fact is it's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot you can do um, to protect um, your, your systems and receivers against interference. But the main thing is you have to understand what the behavior is in the effect of it in interference. So for example, some of the waveforms I've shown you tonight might not affect your receiver. But unless you test your receiver, um, unless you understand the environment they're operating and you, you, you just don't know. So I would say that the, the best way forward is to, to get a quantitative understanding um, of, of the effects of interference on, on receivers and then use that to inform uh, a mitigation technique, which could be in the receiver, it could be simpler than that, it could just be an operational improvement. But there's lots of things you can do today. And, and, and this way of, of putting it together seems to me to be the logical a logical framework and it also goes well with um, Professor Bradford Parkinson's protect, toughen and augment um, 
uh, framework for, for, for GNSS as well, which I think is a really important um, concept. Um, well, th this picture um, is actually of uh, some uh, is actually of a, a driver who ended up in Lake Huron, and w would probably need the services of the of the U.S. Coast Guard to help them out of there. They were following their GPS and followed it blindly into the lake. Uh, mitigation, uh, I, I suppose, of some kind is that it did happen at night. Um, but to wrap up, um, we, you know. GPS and GNSS have unique advantages, and, and they're going to be a key component for position navigation and timing for the foreseeable future. Interference threads are widespread. As most of you said in the poll, we think they have got worse. There's a lot of unintentional interference out there, more than we thought, and there's a lot of intentional interference as well. We, we give people the motives to uh, cause um, deliberate interference sometimes. Uh, the main points, don't be left in the dark. You, you can't leave something like this to guesswork, I guess. I, I can only say that. Um, you need to you know, carry out that risk assessment, test against real-world threats, understand the environment that you're operating in, and then aim for that informed mitigation strategy that, that's very much based on quantitative data. And if you do that, you will make things better. Um, thank you very much, and with that, I shall hand back to Demos. All right, uh, thank you, Guy. Uh, all right, so let's move on to our next panelist. Our next panelist is uh, Rick Hamilton. Uh, Rick Hamilton is a 35-year career Coast Guardsman. Uh, he retired as a Master Chief Quartermaster after 28 years of active duty with an expertise in ship handling, navigation, buoy positioning, search and planning, and Coast Guard operations. He returned to the Coast Guard duty as a civilian as an Executive Secretary for the U.S. Government Civil GPS Service Interface, Commi uh, Interface Committee, uh, where he coordinates government interagency inter public meetings to brief the public on the status of civil uh, GPS programs. Uh, in this role, he fulfills a responsibility as the member of the U.S. delegation and an associate member of the United States hosted International Committee on Global Navigation Satellite Systems, representing CGSIC and the Department of Homeland Security. His work involves fostering cooperation and information sharing between existing and emerging GNSS service centers and educating the public on the benefits of using GNSS and the impact of disruptions to it. Uh, with that, uh, I will hand it over to you, Rick. Uh, thank you very much, Demos. I'm, I'm uh, honored to be here, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about um, uh, uh, something that's becoming a, a big problem in the world today. So uh, th these are some of the subjects I'd like to uh, talk about today. Um, why it's necessary to protect GNSS frequencies, some of the illegal use being discovered, and some of the measures being taken to address the growing proliferation of jammers. The GPS signal is different than standard radio signals. It's different mainly by the amount of power it has when received by your roof or your external antenna. The GPS satellites are almost 11,000 miles in space and they don't transmit with enough power for the GPS signals to be as powerful as the terrestrial radio signals that you see with your cell phone or your AM FM radio. But it, uh, the GPS signal can be extracted from this noise. Uh, a typical GPS receiver has approximately 40 dB of processing gain. When it looks at the noise, it can see something. If we exceed this level of uh, uh, tolerated level of natural interference, then we probably have a jamming event. While traveling around the U.S., you could come across some GPS disruptions that are actually government authorized use and testing. Uh, governments have strict processes to apply for testing on GPS frequencies. Uh, all these applications go through the Federal Communications Commission and the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, the NTIA, for authorization to transmit on a government frequency for testing purposes. The NAVSEN, uh, NAVSEN the Coast Guard Navigation Center, uh, routinely receives interference reports from all over the world. So we do hear about some nation state possible nation state deliberate jamming. A um, couple of cases, uh, uh, International Airlines has uh, reported 
complete loss of GPS on, on air routes over Iran. And in 2010, some very high power interference on GPS frequencies began in South Korea with reports to now send from nine separate commercial airlines losing GPS on approach to landing from very far out to sea. So what are jammers? These devices are commonly called signal blockers, GPS jammers, cell phone jammers, text blockers. Uh, we have to acknowledge what they are. These are illegal radio frequency transmitters designed to block, jam, or otherwise interference, uh, interfere with authorized radio communications. Why are they prohibited? Because jammers just don't weed out noisy or annoying conversations and disable unwanted GPS tracking. Jammers can prevent 911 or other emergency phone calls from getting through or interfere with police or other law enforcement communications and, uh, and a whole other array of uses that uh, provide efficiencies and critical services to the nation. A jammer can block all radio communications on any device that operates on radio frequencies within its range. And jamming technology uh, generally does not discriminate between desirable or undesirable communications. Uh, for instance, jammers can prevent your cell phone from making or receiving calls, text messages, emails, prevent your Wi-Fi enabled device from connecting to the internet. It uh, can pre uh, prevent your GPS unit from receiving correct positioning signals. And it can prevent a first responder from locating you in an emergency. There are economic consequences. Uh, there was an interference event a couple of years ago at a highly automated container port in the uh, US at a mid-Atlantic port facility where some of the port crane operations were shut down for a few hours. These facilities handle thousands of containers per day, uh, not the one pictured on the left here I've uh, provided for co comedy relief. Uh, these kind of facilities still exist today. We're talking about a modern container facility such as shown on the uh, right here. This is not a picture of the effective port. It was just a good depiction of the possible magnitude of operations. This is Shanghai Harbor. In the past 13 years, the container throughput of the Port of Shanghai increased from uh, 6.43 million TEUs, or 20-foot equivalent unit. This is a 20-foot container, such as that on the boat on the left there. Uh, that was recorded in 2001 to 33.62 million TEUs in 2013. Just one of these ships can carry as many as 9,500 40-foot containers, 19,000 TEUs. Jammers overwhelm anti-theft devices on cars and trucks and uh, 46 luxury cars were returned to the Port of Los Angeles after they were discovered with GPS jammers attached to the batteries. They've been used in the vicinity of airports disrupting air traffic. The picture in the bottom left shows the government cut in Miami, Florida. Cruise, captain, uh, cruise ship captains were reporting that they had lost GPS due to interference while in the turning basin there. It was more of a nuisance because the pilot is turning the ship at that point, but without an operating electronic positioning device on board at all times, they are technically in violation of SOLAS regulations. Preachers and teachers have been caught using jammers to establish quiet zones and text-free zones in churches and schools. Responding to a complaint, an uh, FCC Enforcement Bureau agent found a certified public accountant who apparently did not want to be disturbed during the busy tax season, so he was using a small and expensive cell jammer inside his office. But the jammer was disrupting critical public safety communications outside his building as well. These jammers are being used to defeat fleet tracking capabilities built into commercial vehicles by the companies that own them. This purpose can be benign as uh, the driver just wanting to see his girlfriend in the company vehicle without being tracked all the way to the theft of high value pharmaceuticals. The U.S. has developed a process to provide for a coordinated government response to a re report of interference. 
the process starts with a problem report, which is shown here on the right. And uh, this report will either go to the U.S. Coast Guard Navigation Center or the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, pictured here is our online form. For those who are familiar, this is different than a uh, International Telecommunications Union form. This is a problem report versus an after action report. But um, we will attempt to triage and or uh, confirm the problem, uh, get a federal asset into the area to confirm that interference exists. And then an interagency, an initial interagency conference call is conducted to provide for a coordinated government response and uh, to discuss the way forward. An official priority is assigned to the event based on the level of operational impact to critical infrastructure. And this priority assigned will define uh, the level of response and the agencies that will be involved. And we regularly conduct uh, uh, regularly scheduled interagency practices and exercises. We're constantly exploring ways that we can communicate across the U.S. government. And recently we've begun to testing an online collaboration tool to tie all involved agencies and operation centers together in near real time. It has a text-based log and displays entries so all authorized viewers can follow activities and add additional information as appropriate and it allows for attachments in JPEG or uh, uh, all sorts and uh, even signature fingerprints as uh, you saw in Guy's uh, presentation earlier. It archives all events for documentation and later analysis, and it serves as a central data repository of a reported uh, interference events. And uh, in the future, we plan to include an automatic email distribution when new events are reported based on the priority level and uh, also the ability to view data uh, gra uh, geographically in a web-based map view viewer. And I think this brings us to our break, so I'll give it back to Demos. All right. Thank you, uh, Rick. All right. At this point, uh, we will go to a Q&A session where uh, we'll uh, answer questions that have been coming in from uh, uh, you, the audience. So let's see. So the first question that I have here is a question that is going to be for Guy. Um, and the question is, I think you addressed it, but if you want to say a little bit more on it, uh, it would be great. Does, uh, does jamming affect applications where GNSS is used for timestamping? And I think the answer is yes, but can you uh, elaborate more on that and tell us if there's anything additional you want to say on that? Yeah, thanks, Damos. Um <clears throat> Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And the, the answer is yeah. Um, you, you know, where timing installations depend on GPS, interference can cause problems and certainly we've deployed um, sensors at other critical nat national infrastructures um, in UK and Europe and some of them do use time and some of them have been quite worried about what interference can do to them if they depend on time on, on precise time um, for example one or a very good example of that precise time um, and a sort of unexpected or problematic effect would be, for example, the national grid. Um, uh, grid systems around the world use uh, GPS quite often for precise timing because they have to uh, very precisely control um, the phases and, and also they have to um, you know, control energy flow in and out to keep grids running. And you, know, you really don't want to um, uh, uh, they use GPS for the precise timing and they've also got a lot of sources of interference so they really need to understand and make sure that, that, that they don't take out the GPS receiver and lose the time synchronization that they need and that's one example and there are lots of other examples like that in telecoms video digital audio broadcasting where precise time is 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 required all the times to and very accurate uh, precise timing too and it needs to uh, be protected because interference can cause you to uh, to lose it or to have to drop to a holdover so um, so th there you go I think hopefully that answers it all right thank you very much uh, Guy uh, next question this one I think is uh, for you Rick and if uh, uh, Guy wants to step in or Grace I don't have an issue but you guys can but I'll direct it at Rick first uh, is how can someone on board a ship identify interna intentional interference or jamming 
Uh, yeah, thanks. That's a good question. And uh, in fact, in, unless you have the kind of equipment that Guy uh, was showing, the kind of specialized equipment that can actually fingerprint uh, and actually tell that you have an overwhelming signal, you're probably not going to know. In fact, you're going to be uh, the experience and the uh, experiment that Guy showed in his presentation off of the English coast there. Uh, showed that uh, there was alarms going off on the ship that they had no idea even existed. So uh, you're probably not going to know what's what's going on for a while. Okay. Um, Guy or Grace, anything you want to add to that, or do you think Rick uh, got it all? Oh, thanks. It's Guy. Um, Rick answered that question very well. He's absolutely right. And and, and yes, without without the equipment to actually <clears throat> detect jamming in, 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 the, in the GPS bands, you, you would actually be, uh, you wouldn't know what, what caused the effects. And, and it can be quite alarming because uh, you get lots of unexpected things happening and you're not really sure what the cause is. So yeah, it, it, and, and uh, it, it's quite, quite a, a fundamental question really. Yeah, and this is Grace here. I agree with both uh, Guy and Rick. And then uh, I also believe if it's uh, jamming, whether it's uh, intentional and or unintentional, the effect on the GPS receivers is more or less the same. They uh, um, dam like um, uh, they uh, damage or have bad effect on the GPS receivers. Uh, so. So no matter whether it's uh, intentional or in unintentional, uh, mitigation techniques have to be applied to ensure the continuing operation of the GPS receivers. Okay. Well, uh, along those lines, uh, Grace, there's another question that just came in, and I think it uh, ties to that, and I'll direct it to you. So are there natural forms of interference or unintentional sources like machinery, power lines, et cetera, that we need to be aware of? And I, I'm, I'm assuming you'll talk to that, but uh, do, you, do you want to say something to that uh, at this moment? Uh, yeah, so it's um, actually I, I will uh, talk about in that in my slides. So, um, so among all these sources, if they leak frequencies into the GPS or the GNSS frequency bands, then they create uh, some kind of uh, jamming or interference to the GPS receivers. Okay. And I actually have a, a nice example later during my presentation, so I'll save that <laughs> for <right>. my part. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And uh, right. this, is, this is Rick, if I could add to that. Um, Go ahead. There's a bunch of natural sources that we found, you know, that have, go through our problem reports, and we found uh, welding shops uh, uh, give off a frequency that is will overwhelm the GPS frequency L-band. Um, we found a boat that was out of the water on the end of a dock that his depth sounder was uh, left on and that overwhelmed the whole marina. Um, so there's different sources that, um, uh, that we find that are completely unintentional, but uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so I, I guess with that, let's uh, let's uh, I guess end this Q and A session here. But we'll have a second one at the end, and we'll uh, and we'll pick up uh, all the questions that are coming in. And please keep on sending questions in, and we'll we'll get to them at the uh, second Q and A. Uh, with that, uh, Laurie, if you could move to the second poll question before we go on. Sure, demos and uh, folks on your screen is that second poll question. Like to hear from you. Uh, while they are illegal to use, purchasing a personal uh, privacy device is legal in uh, any of the following, in your opinion, United States, People's Republic of China, European Union, Russian Federation, or not legal in any of the above. Okay, looking like 35% uh, saying in the U.S., 28, People's Republic of China, 18 in the European Union, another 18 in the Rush, uh, Russian Federation, and 43% saying not legal in any of the above. <laughs> Demos? All right. It looks like we're going to have a lot of surprised people when uh, Rick uh, presents the uh, next set of uh, slides talking about the rules and regulations associated uh, with uh, such devices. So without uh, much ado, I'll let Rick uh, uh, tell us about some of the laws and uh, regulations associated uh, jamming and interference. Rick? Okay. I think I'm back. Yes, you are. Um, in order to be uh, completely effective in the U.S., uh, these jammer laws are generally instituted in four different authorities. Uh, the U.S. federal statutes, uh, this is legislation. 
telecom agency rules in the US, this is the FCC, uh, the criminal code and international treaties. And I'll try to speak a little bit to each one. Rel uh, relevant US legislation is in the form of the Communications Act. Uh, it is illegal to operate jammers in the US unless you are a user authorized by the federal government. It is illegal to import jammers into the US. If you purchase a jammer online and ship it to the US, you have violated federal law. When you buy a jammer from outside the US, used or new, you become the importer of an illegal device. It is illegal to sell or advertise jammers online or in stores. The act prohibits willful or malicious interference with radio communications of any station licensed or authorized under the act or operated by the US government. And it provides for monetary fines for illegal interference and equipment may be seized and forfeited to the government. Secondly, you have to provide for an agency uh, to give them the appropriate uh, guidance to identify those that are in violation. And these are uh, the two uh, Code of Federal Regulation laws that uh, give the FCC the, uh, their guidance. And in the US, the Federal Communications Commission rules broadly define marketing as to include any offer for sale to US consumers. Third, a government department that can enforce the regulations. Title 18 of the US Code contains the criminal and penal code of the US government. The code prohibits acts that destroy or endanger an aircraft, and this applies to the drunken passenger and in-flight safety. Navigation facilities, US government communications, satellite communications, these all apply to GPS signals and violation of the code subjects an operator to possible fines, imprisonment, or both. To protect our national airspace, code includes an interagency agreement between the FAA, the Bureau of Investigation, and the FCC to locate, identify, and resolve any deliberate radio frequency interference acts such as uh, contra uh, phantom controller incidents. And this is the person who gets on an FAA frequency and pretends to be an air traffic controller giving hazardously misleading information to pilots in flight. Lastly, the US works internationally to promote adoption of standardized rules through organizations like the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, and the International Maritime Organization, the IMO, and most recently with the UN hosted, uh, the United Nations hosted International Committee on Global Navigation Satellite Systems. At a past uh, uh, ICG, uh, the International Committee on GNSS uh, Interference Detection and Mitigation Workshop, we polled the other member countries on the laws they enforce related to the jammers, and this is what we came up with. And this uh, went directly to that uh, poll question you had earlier. Uh, note, it is legal to own a jammer in some places, including the US, but illegal to operate it. And this is a loophole that the FCC is reportedly uh, working to try to close. There have been five ICG uh, interference detection and mitigation workshops so far. Uh, one was just last week in Changsha, China. This is a relevant recommendation adopted and presented to the committee, uh, urging other countries to work on developing systems capable of detecting and locating uh, jamming activities. Workshops have invited presentations from governments and companies that are developing these uh, geolocation capabilities. And in 2014, uh, at the workshop, an overview of the EU-funded detector project was given, and they had a lot of the capability uh, to provide the signatures, uh, pictures that Guy had earlier in his uh, presentation. Also, the Design Bureau Vector from Russia outlined the recommendation that if you model under normal circumstances 
the emissions in the GNSS frequency bands around your critical infrastructure, it'll be easier to detect emissions that don't belong there. At the 2015 workshop, uh, the Harris Corporation gave an overview of their Signal Century 1000 jammer geolocation system, and I've provided a couple of links to those that had them that uh, will give you a short explanation of those systems. A continuing theme at the ICG workshops has been this idea of crowdsourcing for jammer geolocation, much like when your GPS tells you there's a traffic slowdown ahead. Mr. Logan Scott presented a good explanation of the concept at an ICG meeting in Boulder last uh, November. And while it was considered a good concept, it was consensus that instead of a government built and operating system, uh, the capability could be implemented by industry, much like the E91 requirement saw GPS chips appear in all cell phones. In uh, conclusion here, um, the threat from jammers is real and growing. There is a proliferation of personal privacy devices, as they're commonly being called. This is really a misnomer. They are not personal privacy devices. They are personal illegal jammers, let alone the drivers just trying to defeat fleet tracking on their own vehicles. They are being used to commit crimes, car theft, emergency communications disruptions. Through the work of organizations like the United Nations hosted ICG, we are making governments aware around the world of the need to promote and establish relevant laws to curb the proliferation and illegal use of jammers. And uh, with that, I'll turn it around to back to Demos. Oh, I have uh, one more uh, slide is just some contact information. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. All right. So uh, let's move on and let me introduce our last uh, panelist here who is Professor Grace, uh, Grace Gao from the University of Illinois. Uh, Grace Gao is an assistant professor in the aerospace engineering department at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, she obtained her PhD degree in electrical engineering from, the, uh, from Stanford University where she did research in the GPS laboratory. She got her PhD in 2008 and after that she actually stayed on and worked as a research associate in the GPS laboratory there for a while uh, and since 2012 she's been a professor at the University of Illinois. Uh, she's won many many awards in the area of GNSS and uh, related activities and I'm not going to mention all of them I'll just uh, name two of them. Uh, she's a recipient of the RTCA Jackson Award and she's also a recipient of the ION Institute of Navigation Early Achievement Award. Uh, with that, I will uh, let Grace uh, tell us about uh, protecting GNSS receivers from jamming and interference. Grace? Thanks, Demos, for the nice introduction. Um, it's my great pleasure to speak here. As uh, Guy and Rick mentioned, uh, the threat from uh, GPS jamming and interference is real and growing. At the same time, the GPS receivers um, and the GPS system has been a stealth utility and has be, uh, played a key component in many critical infrastructures ranging from uh, transportation to uh, communication systems, power grade, as well as uh, the financial operations. So uh, in my part of the presentation today, I will focus more on the approaches to uh, uh, mitigate such uh, jamming and interference effect and to better protect the receivers. So before I list specific uh, approaches, I invite everybody uh, to sit back and pause for a moment. Just try to think about if we want to address this uh, uh, GPS anti-jamming, anti-interference um, uh, issue, what is the big picture approach? How, how shall we like, uh, tackle this problem? We know that the jammers and interference uh, they are enemies to the GPS receivers. So if we want to protect ourselves or the GPS users, we need to know our enemy and also know ourselves. And then when we look closely, we'll see that there are actually uh, some uh, fundamental differences uh, between the jammers and interf uh, interference uh, and uh, the GPS users. 
for example, there's a, a spatial uh, difference. Uh, the interference are jammers, they are often local or they are on or near the ground. Well, the GPS satellites, uh, they are all over above us, and then the satellites are over 20,000 kilometers above us. In, uh, on the other hand, uh, there are also differences in terms of the, uh, the signal uh, structure of uh, the uh, jammers or interference and the GPS uh, legitimate signals. The GPS signals is uh, a CDMA signal, and then the jammers and interference, uh, they, uh, they may have different forms of uh, uh, the time or frequency uh, signatures. Also, uh, a GPS jammer is aimed at GPS frequencies. When we look at a, a GPS user, and often other than GPS, they have other navigational sensors on board. At the same time, uh, we, we can uh, develop uh, advanced uh, signal processing technologies to uh, even more harden the GPS receiver. And then in terms of know about my, ourselves, uh, we should be also aware of the self-interference. Uh, and then this is a picture of uh, my former graduate student, Daniel Cho, and this is uh, from his, uh, his own real experience. I remember Daniel was, uh, trying to uh, come up, like uh, generate some results and to, um, to submit a conference paper. And then the conference paper deadline was approaching, he just couldn't get the results. And then we tried everything possible. We, we actually replaced the GPS antenna, we replaced the uh, antenna cables, and we used different data set to test his algorithms. But it was, like, it was just not working. He just couldn't get any results to, to, to put in his conference paper before the deadline. At the end, we finally realized that for his own laptop here, uh, the, mm, the, the hard disk um, of, uh, from his, uh, it's a solid state hard uh, disk from his laptop actually leaks uh, um, uh, uh, signals in the GPS frequency band. And that caused interference. And then also, I, I in, in fact, it jammed, it jammed his uh, GPS reception. Therefore, he couldn't get any result. So once we replace the laptop with a different one, with a different kind of um, solid state hard drive, uh, he finally got the result. OK, so um, once we know the differences between the jammers and interference and then the legitimate GPS signals, we can come up with solutions to address uh, in terms of either spatial filtering or time frequency filtering, inertial aiding, or vector tracking or direct positioning. Uh, and then first is uh, the spatial filtering. In other words, it's uh, also called antenna array. Given a uh, jammer is local and is coming from the ground from a certain direction, well, our satellite, GPS satellites are all above us. We can use the antenna array to steer the antenna away from the GPS jammers. In other words, this is also called null stealing. And in this way, we can mitigate the effect from the jammers and try to focus more on the satellites, uh, which are not influenced by the jammers. So this is about taking advantage of the, uh, the spatial difference between the uh, GPS uh, system and then the jammer. At the same time, uh, the jamming signal and the, or interference signal may have uh, quite different uh, signal time or frequency uh, characteristics from the GPS signals. Uh, here is one example about uh, DME interference mitigation. DME stands for Digital Measurement Equipment, and that is uh, used by airplanes to determine the distance from the airplane to the ground DME beacons. And then for this example, we can see that for DME signal in the time do domain, the DME signal is uh, uh, pulse pairs in the time domain. Well, in the frequency domain, we also see all these spikes. Uh, for the DME signal, the, the frequency domain, they are narrow uh, frequency tones, uh, frequency components in frequency. And then with this characteristics, we can come up with the joint time and frequency filtering and just to, uh, for, for, from the received signal, uh, overall signal we take out, all these um, areas as illustrated in the red dots. And then the DME interference is just one example. 
And then uh, in terms of interference and jamming, we have a vi wider variety of different kinds of uh, jamming or interference signals. And then so we can come up with uh, um, uh, um, um, a wide range of um, uh, uh, time and frequency joint filtering solutions. Uh, maybe just only use a time domain or you only use a transform domain filtering. For example, if uh, the, uh, uh, the interference or the jammers, they have low duty cycle sparse pulses in time domain, we can use uh, pulse nulling in the time domain to uh, mitigate that effect. Or if uh, the interference, if it's a, a continuous wave and that translates to a single frequency tone, then we can use some uh, frequency do, uh, domain uh, uh, filtering method to mitigate that. When we look at a, a GPS user, uh, often um, there are other sensors than the GPS on board. And then one of the uh, most common sensors uh, on board will be uh, uh, inertial measurement units. And then uh, inertial measurement units as illustrated in this block here, uh, that consists of accelerometers and gyros. And then uh, it can determine uh, the attitude, position, and velocity, velocity information for the user. And this block is about a, a regular GPS receiver uh, this is actually a scalar tracking receiver. Uh, the inertial measurement units uh, or inertial systems, uh, they are complementary with uh, the GPS system because the uh, inertial uh, uh, system does not rely on external um, radio frequency transmission. So it's working on its own. So therefore, it's, uh, it's uh, robust against any kind of uh, electromagnetic uh, jamming uh, attacks. However, the inertial measurement system, the errors of the, uh, from the inertial system can drift over time and can, can even go unbounded. So we will need uh, the high fidelity GPS solutions to try to calibrate or to correct the inertial um, uh, uh, system solutions over time. When we try to uh, integrate the inertial system with the GPS system, there are different levels of uh, integration, either loosely coupled or tightly coupled, or even ultra tight or deep coupled. So when we talk about loosely coupled, that means we integrate the IS with the GPS coordinate or GPS solutions. So here in this picture, we see this is a standalone GPS receiver, and this is a standalone INS. We just take the output from both systems, and then we blend them together like this. In, uh, by contrast, uh, contrast uh, the tightly coupled solution is uh, instead of using the direct uh, GPS coordinate output from the GPS signals, we take the outputs from the correlators, or in other words, uh, the pseudo range or the carrier phase measurements. And then we integrate that with the inertial measurement outputs. There's a, another level of integration is the ultra tight or deeply coupled integration. Well, we, we uh, use, take the inertial measurement input and then we directly assist uh, the GPS correlators uh, in the vector delay lock loop setting like this. And since we are talking about um, the vector delay lock loop, and then actually the vector tracking is another way to uh, make the GPS receiver more robust compared to the scalar tracking. For vector tracking, the main difference between vector tracking and scalar tracking is that um, for scalar tracking, we have, there's no feedback. So we have individual channels, we calculate the, the pseudo range and the carry phase uh, measurement, and then we output to the navigation filter. However, for vector tracking, there is a feedback here. Once we feedback the um, position, velocity, and time information back to the individual channels or the tracking loops, we are actually coupling all the, uh, the channels together instead of having them uh, uh, to be independent. There's another concept similar to vector tracking for taking advantage of all the uh, available uh, GPS signal uh, 
energy, which is called direct positioning. For direct positioning, we couple all the satellite signals even more. And then uh, in direct positioning, there are no individual ch satellite channels. Instead, we may have uh, guesses of possible uh, GPS receiver uh, uh, position, uh, location, and velocity. Then based on the guess points, and then based on the, the satellite position, we calculate, uh, we can uh, calculate the overall sum. We can generate the overall sum of all the uh, code replicas with respect to individual satellite. And then we only perform one overall uh, correlation between the, um, the expected signal reception and the, the real signal reception. And then among all the guess points, we find the best match, which um, corresponds to uh, the, the highest aggregated signal power. So with that, um, in summary, I, uh, we have uh, talked about uh, different methods uh, for mitigating uh, uh, GPS interference and jamming. Uh, we want to uh, take advantage of the differences between the jammers and the, the, the legitimate GPS signals. Uh, we have spatial filtering method, which is like an antenna array to beamform uh, the antenna reception away from the jammer. We can use time frequency filtering. Uh, we can also use other sensors such as IMUs, and we can also have advanced signal processing techniques for the receivers. That means instead of uh, having a traditional scalar tracking, we can have vector tracking or direct positioning. So with that, I think that that's all I want to present in my slides today, and I'll hand this over to demos. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Grace. All right. So uh, before we head off to the final Q and A, a couple of things uh, as far as next steps go. The this uh, presentation um, will be available on the Inside GNSS uh, website, and possibly some additional uh, information in the form of texts also might be available at that uh, that website. And we've also have uh, contact info for Inside GNSS and Milvatel. So if you want to. Uh, look up more information on both. Uh, they are here on the slide. All right, so uh, before again we head to the final Q&A, let's do one more poll question. And Lori, if you could set up the poll. Absolutely. Final poll for today, which of the following best describes your experience? Is it, I have experienced signal interference in the last few years, I've never experienced signal interference, or I'm not sure if I have ever experienced signal interference. Showing a uh, front runner here, 61% have, have experienced signal interference in the last few years. Uh, just 9% have never experienced it, and 30% uh, are not quite sure. Demos? Well, that's, uh, I mean, that's an interesting number, 61% having seen or experienced uh, interference. So it's definitely an important topic, and uh, I guess we were glad to have shared some of our, uh, some of the experts' uh, findings and uh, thoughts on the topic. So with that, let's go to the uh, final uh, Q&A, I guess. And uh, there's been a lot of questions coming in from the audience, so let's uh, let's try to get to those. If we don't get to any of you, it's not because we're picking out anyone. It's just that we have a lot of questions coming in. So with that, uh, let me start out with the first one, and I'll direct this one at you, uh, Grace. And I think the question is, uh, I mean, how do you mathematically model jamming or jammers for, I guess, for receivers when you do analysis or, you know, you're coming up with... Uh, algorithms. Yeah, um, so um, there are different models, depends on the type of jammers. Uh, the most, um, I would say, the simplest model would be uh, modeling the jammers as just like a thermal noise or Gaussian uh, white uh, ad, ad, uh, Gaussian noise added to uh, the uh, GPS signal reception. All right, thanks. Uh, let's see, next question. This one is going to be for you, Guy. And uh, someone noted that uh, you talked about uh, uh, Spirant models, uh, uh, modeling jamming effects on GNSS receivers, um, able to model effects on other ancillary systems. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. Um, thanks, Damos. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, very interesting. Yes, the, the answer is yes, you can. Um, it, it can be more problematic, but yes, you can do it. In fact, the the trial on the um, on the ship for the Stavog project is shows that you can 
model effects. In this case, they were using a, a real jammer and over the air. Um, <clears throat> so you can do that. You can, if you can get a system into an anechoic chamber somewhere, which is well shielded and set the system up, you can uh, you certainly use over the air testing and go through to the antenna. Uh, but you can also simulate um, signals from uh, from jammers and from um, and from the G GNSS satellites and take them and put the whole effect uh, or the whole test bench into a laboratory as well uh, where you don't actually radiate um, <clears throat> RF and if you can do that as well you can obviously see what the effects might be on, on some of the other on the associated systems as long as they're all connected. All right, uh, thank you uh, Guy. Uh, next question, this one is for you Rick and the question is are you aware of other problem like interference and jamming reporting systems outside uh, of, the, of the U.S. or others than the ones that you uh, that you presented. Uh, I'm working closely in the uh, International Committee on GNSS to um, uh, to be the model for this kind of uh, uh, problem reporting, and uh, we're actually making uh, official agreements between uh, Europe and the U.S. right now. We're starting a dialogue with China, and. Um, and with Russia, and we're presenting these things in the uh, working group C of the ICG. Um, and uh, right now, the really active one is the Galileo, the EU's Galileo Service Center. I'm working almost every day. I talk to them and uh, show them uh, other things that we're doing, how we're doing these things. All right. Thank you, Rick. Uh, next question. This one I'm going to direct at you, Grace, but uh, if Guy or Rick want to step, uh, step in afterwards, that would be great too. Um, and it's the, uh, at, at what stage, uh, I'm paraphrasing the question, but at what stage of, uh, of a receiver's operation is interference and jamming most uh, critical? Acquisition, tracking, or during the navigation phase? Or uh, does it really matter? Um, I would say to protect the GPS receivers against jamming, um, you know, all these stages are, are, are useful. Uh, for example, when I mentioned about the antenna array method, it's really at the antenna reception stage. And then I guess when the question asks about the acquisition and tracking stage, this is uh, referring to uh, the scalar tracking method. Um, and then for that, when we uh, integrate uh, the GPS scalar tracking with, uh, uh, say, inertial measurement uh, systems, then we can uh, do the uh, INS and GPS uh, integration in either the, uh, like, uh, the, uh, um, the ball signal level or the measurement level or the navigation solution level um, that corresponding to deep coupling or tight coupling or loose coupling. Uh, at the same time, we do not really uh, have to stick with um, um, scalar tracking. We can come up with uh, uh, more advanced, uh, uh, of course, it will be more complicated so, uh, GPS uh, receiver processing techniques such as vector tracking or even direct positioning. All right. Um, anything you want to add to that, uh, perhaps, Guy, or do you think Grace uh, got it all? Oh, great. Grace answered that question very well, actually, a fantastic answer. Um, I, I think I'll just add to it um, a, a little bit. I, I can add a little bit to it and say, you know, certainly in in my experience testing some of the receivers recently in the last few years, you know, there's no doubt that re receivers can be more sensitive to these effects when they're t we're trying to reacquire. That's that's quite a vulnerable state for a receiver to be in, um, not just for interference, but especially for, for for other effects as well. But for interference, it can be an issue. You know, some receivers will always um, acquire on GPSL1, for example, and that's the frequency that's most likely to be jammed. Um, and some timing receivers will uh, go out and get download information from the first GPS satellite that they see, um, which can also be, um, you, you know, something that makes them more, more vulnerable to interference. All right. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, you know, I'll start with you, Guy, but I think it's we've got a lot of these questions, and I'm going to try to fuse them together into one question, and hopefully all three of you could uh, chime in on it. Um, and it's basically, what is going to be the effect of other GNSS systems uh, coming in the future, and uh, I mean, are they going to is there going to be issues with self-interference uh, between GNSSs? Uh, are they going to solve the problem of uh, you know, 
uh, of interference and uh, jamming. Um, what is the effect of uh, other uh, GNSS signals going to be on, on on GPS and the whole whole work? So, again, trying to trying to fuse several questions of that nature that came in. So I'll I'll let you start, Guy, with uh, with that one. <clears throat> okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sure the, I'm, I'm sure Grace and Rick will have some interesting things to say about this as well. This is quite a big topic. Um, <clears throat> from my perspective, um, you know, I I always like to put this. I think Bradford Parkinson um, has has got this amazing kind of systems engineering framework for uh, looking after GPS, which is his protect, toughen and augment framework, and it, it helps us a lot to think about the effects of things that we do. And in terms of adding more constellations or frequencies, that's just one of the techniques for toughening um, a receiver. But again, you know, as you said, Demos, as well, there might be some, uh, there can be, if you have too many frequencies and too many constellations, you can get a bit of self-interference. Also, you know, there's no doubt um, that, that we've seen recently jammers that operate on more frequencies than just GPS R1. And because the GPS signals themselves are, are, are relatively weak, it, it's, it's, not, um, it, it's, not, it, it's not impossible or, or difficult particularly to have a, 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 a small compact jammer that will operate on more than one frequency, unfortunately. So they're probably other things we can do to toughen the receiver rather than just adding um, more frequencies and constellations. So it might help a little bit. Um, and I think the other two things that go hand in hand are you know, legislation, we need legislation, the US has been one of the leaders here, and, and also augmentation. And the augmentation part of the framework is important. You know, in other words, instead of just toughening using um, using GNSS, you use a different type of augmentation such as inertial or ELORAN. All right. Um, Rick, anything uh, you want to say about uh, about this uh, topic on uh, future GNSS and how that's going to shape things? Uh, I think, you know, as an operational guy, you know, we welcome additional signals and I don't think you're going to be able to find a receiver that is not multi-system uh, capable uh, in the near future, but they all uh, operate in the um, in the L band, and uh, and so you know if we're jamming one, we're it's going to be jamming everybody. Right. Uh, anything you want to add to that, uh, Grace, or did uh, Rick and uh, Guy get it all? I think Rick and Guy did a fantastic job on this. Uh, I just uh, want to comment, you know, if possible, if we can design the future GNSS signals in the way that is more robust to jamming, I think that would be great. Right. Uh, let's see. All right. Lots of questions here, but uh, uh, next one is going to be for... Right, so yeah, this one would be for Rick, um, and it's a question about, uh, I guess, uh, someone talking, uh, they're interested in, uh, I guess, citing new airports in a, in a given place, the new airports that are being built, new airport projects. Any recommendations or is where someone could find recommendations about what kind of things people should be aware of when, uh, when doing that with respect to uh, jamming and interference uh, issues? Uh, maybe, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Grace. Either one of you. So I was going to start with Rick, and if uh, Rick, if you want Grace to go ahead, go, Grace could go ahead and answer it, and then Rick could. Go. Either one of you, go ahead. Uh, Grace. Grace, Grace, go ahead. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I I think we can learn from the New York Airport lesson. Uh, try to if there's a highway next to the airport, at least try to pull the, the GPS antennas away from the highway. And I, and uh, yeah, that's that's exactly right. If if they position a GPS receiver somewhere on the airport for these new landing systems, these uh, ground-based augmentation systems that you uh, um, make some sort of protection for the uh, antenna, which is what they did up there in Newark. They just put uh, some sort of uh, a wall in between the receiver highway to prevent uh, these personal jammers from uh, reaching the antenna, but um, I would ask uh, uh, if you really want some uh, answers to that question that you uh, go to the um, my contact information on my slides and drop me an email and I will refer you to somebody in the FAA that can actually uh, that can actually help you with this. Right. Uh, 
not sure there's anything you want to add to this guy or uh, no, I think uh, I think Rick and Grace um, did a, a great job with that answer. Those those are the, the considerations. The only thing I, um, to to make it plain, I suppose, is that is that really what we found is that is that the effect of the jammer on the system definitely depends on line of sight. So if you've got an area where you think there's interference or jamming coming from, a line of sight, having a clear line of sight will is, is something you don't want. So if you can avoid having line of sight to that suspected source, um, you'll be better off. Okay. Um, next question is uh, again. Um, uh, this one be for Rick. Uh, it's in the U.S. regarding um, uh, jamming interference. If someone notices, I guess, a a, a blatant case of jamming and interference, um, I mean, who do they who do they report it to right away? I know that there are these online forums, but if there's what, what would be the what's the what's the correct way to go about it? Um, um, if so, if I observe someone. You know, in the middle so, of a jamming event. So the U.S. has what we affectionately call our triad, and there's three operation centers that represent different communities. The uh, Air Force GPS Operation Center in Colorado Springs, they represent the military. The FAA uh, National Operations Control Center, they represent the uh, the airspace, and the nav uh, Navigation Center represent the, the rest of the civil public. Each of those um, uh, if you're asking and uh, if you're noticing aviation uh, interference, you can go to the FAA's website and they have a problem report. If it's other, you can go to the NAVSEN and put in a report. And uh, we act on those uh, right away and we actually track them from uh, when we get the report till we get them an answer. And uh, when, when they do report a problem, we immediately go and check to, with the Air Force to see that there, uh, if there was a system problem, uh, if it was caused by the ground control problem as uh, there was uh, back in January, end of January, um, or if, uh, and we check space weather. Uh, so we do all that kind of thing to make sure that it's not us that's causing the problem. And then we start looking for, an, uh, for another answer. So there is a process and you can actually uh, fill out the problem reports at the FAA or the Navigation Center. Excellent. Thanks. Um, let's see. Uh, next uh, question. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's, it's based on a, um, a comment uh, um, on the uh, something, uh, a comment that uh, you made, Guy, on, uh, on uh, other ways of uh, Helping. It's basically the. Uh, uh, do you have any input or your opinion on uh, Eloran system and uh, how it's going to play relative to GNSS in uh, in uh, in Europe? Yeah, I've got a. Yeah, that's a very good question, and I, I don't. I'm not going to go too much into the politics of Eloran um, because they are quite complicated, especially in Europe right now. Um, but talking about what Eloran does and why it's such a, a good augmentation of the system. Is because it, it, it it's a it's a low, much lower frequency signal, and and as such the power level is is much stronger in the signal, and it means it's much harder to interfere with or or to to spoof. So it, it, it this wave as well. Um, so so actually if you were because of its lower frequency, if you were going to try and jam it, you'd need um, some very um, Conspicuous and powerful equipment. It wouldn't look like the, like the small, uh, uh, very small boxes that, that Rick showed in his presentation. So you'd, you'd probably um, detect someone trying to build an Eloran jammer. Um, it would be a very tall, big antenna. Um, and and so I think Eloran has a lot of characteristics that make it, you know, one of the augmentation systems that, that would be very good to, to use as a supplement to GNSS. I think. Right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, um, next question. Uh, this one would be for uh, for you, Grace, and uh, it has to do with uh, with vector tracking. And uh, the the question is: Do you um, uh, do you see vector tracking receivers becoming, I guess, standard in the near future? And what what are the trade offs? What is the? I mean, they're great for uh, dealing with. Uh, Making a receiver robust, but uh, what what, I mean, what are the downsides, and uh, can you say a little bit about uh, about that? Yeah, so this is a very nice method, and that provides additional robustness for the GPS receiver. 
At the same time, uh, the trade-off is the complexity. So it depends on the receiver uh, industry, the, the receiver manufacturers, what's their, like, um, uh, uh, their goal of uh, you know, having a trade-off between the receiver cost and complexity as well as the robustness. I guess this will be um, based on the applications. Uh, I, I don't think this will, like uh, for low-end uh, GPS receivers, I, probably this won't happen immediately, but uh, for some high-end receivers that are used in critical infrastructures, uh, this will be a quite promising technique. Okay. Uh, next question is for Rick, and I guess Guy and uh, Grace, you could uh, also uh, chime in after Rick. Uh, when you when talked about interference reports coming in, you said you also look at interference coming from, you know, the ionosphere or uh, other, uh, other uh, you know, natural sources. Could you say a little bit about, uh, about that and uh, uh, what you meant by that? Uh, if I grasp your question, uh, th there is, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, um, things that can cause uh, disturbances of the GPS signal as it passes through the atmosphere, the ionosphere, bouncing off of charged ions in the atmosphere, troposphere, solar flaring. Um, all of these things can cause uh, big and can be very large interference events. Um, and we do get, uh, there are uh, uh, areas of the world down by the equator, Brazil, Singapore are two big up above Singapore, uh, two big areas that we know there's a lot of scintillation. Um, uh, so there can be very large natural uh, uh, interferences that can cause problems with the, with the uh, GPS signal. And that's why we check with the very smart people at the uh, Space Weather Prediction Center in uh, Boulder. And they can tell us if there has been an event and they have a they have a satellite that's sitting out there halfway to the sun that can tell us, give us, I'm not sure how many seconds advance warning, but um, but they know when there's big uh, events coming towards the Earth and they can tell us what, what part of the Earth it's going to hit. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's a really good answer, Rick. And yeah, we're we're currently working with um, a, 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 a what we call a knowledge transfer associate, who's a, a graduate student on on atmospheric effects, uh, so because we want to try and and model and and be able to simulate those effects to see what they do to receivers. Um, and and she's always reminding me of some of the big events. Like I think there was a, a massive solar burst in 2006 that caused a lot of disruption, um, because the solar burst does act as interference source. And in 2006, so it was a time when the sun was at solar minimum, uh, so it, sh it doesn't often erupt, but this time it was a, a very big eruption and it was aimed straight at Earth and it caused a lot of disruption and you can, you'll probably find some literature on the web about that particular event. All right. Well, again, we have a lot of questions, but uh, I guess we're running out of time. So let me ask one more question. This would be for you, Grace, and uh, mm -hmm. kind of kind of a loaded question. And it is, uh, uh, what is from all the present methods you presented for interference interference mitigation? Which one is the best? I'm pretty sure there's no answer for that. So, <laughs> you guys, yeah, and, uh, you guess right. So um, there's, I, I would say there's no best single answer. Um, it's, it will be, you know, de really depends on the applications and depends on the trade-off of how complex you want the solution to be, you know, how low cost or like expensive you want the solution to be. And then it could be a combination of all these uh, methods I uh, mentioned today. All right. Well, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Thanks for all the questions. And uh, I think at this point, uh, I will hand it over to Lori. All right. Well, thank you, Demos. And folks, before we do sign off, uh, again, another thanks to each of you for joining and trust that you found today's presentation to be of value. Special thanks to our speakers today for all of your time and effort. And of course, our sponsors and co-hosts, Novatel, Inside GNSS, and Inside Unmanned Systems. Uh, so again, thanks for joining. This is Lori Dearman saying hope you have a great rest of the week. Bye for now.